to acknowledge the Bedial people that are the traditional custodians of the land. Um, I would also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past, present, and extend the respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. Um, today, uh, we have like uh, two speakers with us. Um, our first speaker is uh, Parisa, Parisa Zarek, who is pursuing her PhD with City Futures. Uh, she has a background in urban design, transport planning. She's going to talk to us about applying uh, geo design in planning for bicycling. Um, over to you, Parisa. Uh, hi, I'll stop presenting. Can you hear me? And yes. Okay, I thought that I said, hold on, you cannot, you couldn't hear me. So I would like to share my screen to start my presentation. Sure. Are you all right, Parisa? Do you need a hand? No, no, it's all right. Oh, it, there we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. Oh, yeah. All good? Yeah. Okay, I had a class just before, just, uh, I just finished that it seems that it's something with things. So, hello everyone. I'm Parisa, and uh, today I'm happy with, uh, to be with you and uh, present uh, some of some part of my PhD thesis. And we are uh, I'm going to talk about the planning and designing for bicycling uh, to having an evidence based approach. Uh, I'm PhD candidate here, and I have a background in urban studies, and I have a master of art in urban design. Uh, my PhD thesis title is Geo Design in planning and designing for bicycling, an evidence-based approach for collaborative bicycling planning uh, that is supervised by Professor Chris Petty, Dr. Simon Leo, and Dr. Ari Kutz. Uh, so today more than half of the world population are living in urban areas, and this is uh, expected to be more than 68% uh, by 2015. Uh, bicycling is an alternative mode of transport that gains uh, attention in the recent year because of uh, this uh, population increase and also because it has a very environmental benefit uh, because it uh, do not produce any emissions or it doesn't need any external energy and also because of its health benefit because it can uh, decrease the risk factor for chronic diseases and its economic benefit uh, as a result of uh, all of these issues. Uh, bicycling is a marginalized mode of transport, especially in Australia. Built environment is uh, one of the main elements that can encourage or discourage bicycling. Uh, we need uh, to consider uh, this relationship when we are uh, going uh, to plan for bicycling network. And uh, there is a need to have a well-connected network of bicycling specific infrastructure, and this can just accomplish through having a comprehensive uh, planning regulation and funding. Uh, so uh, I just want to have a brief of a research gap that uh, I uh, go through in my PhD thesis. As I said, uh, there is a um, relationship between a built environment and bicyclist behavior. Uh, although there are lots of studies that have tried to understand the effect of built environment on bicyclist behavior, but uh, how should these studies be used in the practice of planning is an issue. Uh, also, uh, we need uh, to engage people and stakeholders in the planning process. Different parties are involved in the process of planning. We need to have a framework uh, to um, engage them in the process of planning for bicycling. Uh, 
Um, now we are in a new uh, data environment of open and crowdsourced data. And uh, for the future of bicycling planning, uh, there can be different uh, future uh, possible and uh, evaluation, uh, possible and desirable futures. We need to use uh, these evidence based approaches and uh, using the information and data to evaluate the possible futures and uh, know that uh, what can be the desirable future. Altogether, uh, we need to have interpretive approach to face the uh, complexity of uh, this issue. And uh, this uh, just uh, can uh, be accomplished through uh, having a, a more comprehensive approach that can involve different uh, peoples and have an uh, evidence-based uh, planning. Uh, so map geo design is a framework that uh, we have proposed uh, to have for bicycling planning in this study because uh, we think that uh, it can cover the research gap that we talk about. Uh, geo design is a, a framework uh, that uh, is a is an environmental design for complex issues in large areas that involve the collaboration of different parties and stakeholders and it needs digital computing and communication technologies. And uh, it depends on feedbacks about our implication and effect of design, uh, proposed design scenarios uh, with simulation and modeling and systematic thinking. In this framework, uh, we will uh, have, um, we will use uh, information technologies and to have an efficient collaboration of decision uh, design professions, people of place, information technologies, and geographic uh, scientists. In, in this fr framework, we will need to answer six main uh, questions. The first one is that how should the study area be described? How, sh how can it be described? How does the study area operate? Is that working well? Uh, how might the study area be changed? And uh, what are the differences uh, that these change may cause? And uh, how should uh, the study uh, be changed finally? And what is our decision for that? Each of these questions is uh, answered by each of these models that are representation, process, evaluation, change, impact, and decision models. So this is the uh, framework of the geo design that we consider for this study. Uh, the aim of geo design is always negotiation. So we are not picking uh, one design, but we are combining different ideas. We are going to understand the history of a place, evaluate the current situation and propose uh, different scenarios and evaluate those scenarios and uh, have the negotiation different different parties uh, to propose uh, the design, final design for the future. So geo design tool is an innovative way uh, to have the potential to integrate technology and the process of decision making in the planning and designing. Uh, yeah, this uh, shows uh, the how uh, geo design process develop. It is start with the concept and guiding principles and after the digitizing and using modeling, and negotiation, we are going to have the final design. Based on this concept, uh, we had uh, proposed to have a co-design workshop during uh, my study. So the aim of the um, co-design workshop was collaboration between different stakeholders. And uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we had this workshop at different stages of the study. The first one was the focus group workshop uh, for understanding the current bicycling planning in the case study, or what is the needs and aims and the components of uh, planning for bicycling. Uh, we had participants from uh, Road and Maritime Services, Greater Sydney Commission, Penrith, Waverley, Liverpool, and City of City Council, and also Transport NSW. Uh, we had also the first geo design workshop uh, to use and test uh, the developed tools and methods in the practice of geo design. Uh, we had participants from master students in the geo design course and also the Penrith Council. And we will have uh, the last workshop in the next 12 months uh, to use the method in practice with Wollongong and uh, Penrith Council. Uh, 
I just want to have an overview of the geodesign workshop uh, to show you how uh, it goes and uh, what uh, what for, what were the you know, tools and the results of this workshop. So uh, it was held in uh, two consecutive weeks in four days in City Analytics Labs. We had online and in-person students. Uh, 30 students was uh, uh, in-person and 19 was uh, online. So we had uh, use different platforms uh, to um, enable uh, this uh, collaboration uh, with online and in-person students. And uh, we use uh, actually uh, Moodle and uh, Blackboard. It's a teaching platform in UNSW. And we have divided the student into five main groups. And uh, yeah, the process of the geo design start with uh, understanding the current situation. Uh, what is the context of the study? What is the um, current planning process? And after discussion groups, uh, students had the evaluation models and evaluate the current situation to see that uh, is that working well uh, based on the propensity to cycle, cycling infrastructure, accessibility by cycle. These are uh, evaluative maps uh, that uh, we um, showed the student and they were um, interactive maps that uh, go to the, through the discussion sessions uh, to have a, this evaluation. Uh, after that, we um, defined some systems that uh, we thought that it is important in the issue. It was based on the safety, end of trip facility, green spaces and landscaping, shared bike and cycling pathway. And at this stage, students start to make some policies uh, to propose uh, the required policies for the uh, study area. And after having discussion, uh, we had four uh, design scenarios that are change models, commuting by bicycling, recreation of bicycling, cycling to school and cycling to high street and shops. And after with uh, having discussion with uh, Penry Council and evaluating the effect of the change models with ABM simulation, uh, we had the final proposed plan. So this is the whole process of geo design uh, we had uh, last year. Uh, this is some of the results of the geo design. Uh, we use different platform, as I mentioned in this workshop. For example, we use Pool Everywhere uh, to keep the student engaging in the process and evaluating their experience. Uh, we also have the Google map uh, to have a collaborative uh, map making. And this is the result of the design scenario part one. You can see that uh, all of the students could uh, draw and could design uh, together. It doesn't have any limitation. And also we had uh, some uh, pre-workshop assessment uh, for uh, understanding uh, the um, what is their uh, opinion about different provisions for planning for bicycling network. And also we had some post workshop a questionnaire to evaluate the student uh, experience from the workshop. Uh, the method that we used for uh, evaluating the design scenario was agent based modeling. Agent based modeling is a method for examining system of individual agents based on their observed behavior in the real world. Basically, in ABM systems, agents have a specific attributes and there is a set of rules between them that drive their actions. Agents uh, have some common attributes that are autonomy. They can have independent decision. They are heterogeneous. They can exist in groups and they are active. It means that they can have independent effect on the simulation. Uh, we defined four main agents for this modeling that are cyclists, road, origin and destinations. Cyclists start their moving from origin to destination from uh, on the graph of their roads. We have defined attributes for each of these agents. For example, for cyclists, we have defined number of cyclists, their uh, speed and objective. For road, what is the cycling infrastructure in the road? What is the length, slope and tree canopy? Uh, we had to use open data sources for defining these uh, characteristics. I would like to show you this video that uh, shows uh, the movement of cycling from uh, their origin to the red point that is the uh, Saint Mary station. This is part of the uh, this is a uh, part of the area that we consider for the geo design workshop. So um, 
you can see that you can select the destination that uh, we are going uh, to ask cyclists to go to. So here we had a selected transport interchange, uh, that is the train station. We can define the number of cyclist agents. We define it like uh, 100 agents, and then the route uh, selection algorithm that can be short as bad or based on the slope. And also, um, we can uh, set that uh, what is the weight of each uh, on a route selection algorithm. For example, the cycling infrastructure is more important or a slope is more important uh, because it depends on the uh, each area that uh, how uh, we are going uh, to say that uh, some areas are flat, so we don't uh, need the slope to have the highest uh, weight. This map uh, shows a number of the agents that has passed through each road segment. Uh, we are going to calculate uh, the number of the agents in the road segments, and uh, we can use this as a um, uh, supporting uh, evidence for decision makers that see that if uh, we are going uh, to have this design scenario, what would be the most used uh, roads that they can put the, infra uh, put the infrastructure on that road? So based on uh, the current result that I have get, uh, the geo design approach can fit into the bicycling planning because it enables the collaboration of different organizations and also it enables the public participation in the process. We can have an evidence-based evaluation of the design scenarios and uh, it means that uh, we can um, approximately see some of the gaps of the uh, research in bicycle planning that we currently have. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Parisa. No um, so we have like another 10 minutes for questions and discussion. Um, I would like to invite questions, either you can uh, type in on the chat or um, unmute yourself and go for it. So uh, I'll start with uh, my, mine. So uh, the, la, towards the end of the presentation, you mentioned about how geo design in cycling in terms of uh, public participation. Mm -hmm. uh, um, could you elaborate on like um, how significant or uh, how useful it will be for public participation aspect of it? So, uh... In the geo design process, uh, the main idea is that we need to uh, have the collaboration between design professions, people of the places, uh, geographic scientists, and also information technologies. Uh, people of the place, um, it means that in the workshop, uh, we are going to see that uh, we are going to invite some of the uh, some of the uh, people that are actually cyclists or uh, from the cyclist groups, uh, their um, head of the cyclist group, something like that. And we are going to invite them in the process. And also uh, we are uh, we can have some surveys prior uh, to the Joe Design Workshop uh, that can we show them uh, what is the perception of the um, bicyclists from the um, a bike plan, what they want, what they need. And uh, we can involve them in the process in this way too. Uh, so yes, so we can have a uh, public participation uh, prior the workshop, prior the um, design workshops, and uh, during the workshop uh, with engaging some of the um, bicycling group uh, in the process, and uh, also after the workshop to have this more communication with them. I think someone has a question. Uh, this question from Nim uh, about like the program language used for the ABM. So uh, I use the um, Gamma software. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that it was the interface of the Gamma. So uh, it has its own language, as Chris mentioned. Uh, it's uh, it is a kind of um, kind of easy to follow uh, that uh, you will uh, define a GIS layer in that and uh, you define different species for that based on the idea of the modeling that you want. For example, if you want to simulate the transportation model, I had just defined four species. That was road, bicyclists, origin and destination. And uh, yeah, 
it was the gamma software. Yeah, and uh, Alessandra. Hey, Brisa, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I have a question. It's, it's more specific. I, I worked on a study last year that looked at how um, women use um, cycling routes specifically. Um, and you mentioned just before that you're going to be looking at um, talking to, you know, the head of cycling groups and stuff like that. Um, are you going to try and capture like different aspects of um, cyclists or because um, I know a lot of women tend to use like footpaths and things like that rather than the road. <laughs> um, yeah, just like, how are you going to try and capture those different um, cyclists essentially? One of the um, things that we have is that we have lots of data. Uh, I had a talk, oh, for example, with uh, Fiona in the city of Sydney, Fiona Campbell. And uh, mm, I figured out that there's lots of data. They have uh, surveys, they have um, different questionnaires from the uh, people, even from different uh, ages and different genders. So uh, they have the data, but uh, mm, it's not completely involved in the process of planning. Uh, with this concept, we are going to see different aspects of the planning and uh, consider that uh, in the process. So. It's right. Uh, we need uh, one of the. If you evaluate the data, you can see that uh, approximately most of the cyclists are the, the male uh, young cyclists, um, based on the Strava data, for example. Uh, so we need to engage the woman in the um, plans. Um, but um, yeah, it's an uh, opportunity that uh, we can have uh, also women engaged in the planning process. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, I have I have one more. Uh, in terms of so since we are um, like since we are um, managing the lab with Chris and so we have been like look, looking at like the smart places which enables collaboration and all. So how significant do you think like having a facility like the city analytics lab is to the um, or how important it is to the uh, geo design process? And have there been examples like where things have been done very well? Or? Yeah, the, well, we had the geo design uh, workshop in the city analytics lab and uh, with uh, all uh, new updated uh, equipment. Actually, it uh, works very well uh, because uh, we could have uh, all the online students on the screen mm -hmm. and they uh, collaborate uh, with the in-person students. And we had also the, the biggest screens um, for collaboration in groups. So we had a uh, six system, I think, in the lab. And each of the group was uh, working on all, uh, each of them, and it works very well actually, uh, because the, it's enabled their collaboration, their discussion, and uh, having online uh, students from China. We had lots of students were from China, so uh, we had a very very great uh, collaboration uh, based on the equipment that we had in the city analytics lab. Um, is there anything that didn't work well? In case if you have to do the lab again, like. What should we do better? Uh, it doesn't work well. Uh, so um, sometimes the uh, working with uh, um, I, I don't remember the, the name of the software that we use uh, to send files to other systems. It's uh, it doesn't Cruiser. work. What was that? Uh, Cruiser, I think. Yeah, Cruiser. So it, it sometimes it doesn't. Uh, work properly with softwares and uh, with uh, other data, you know, it doesn't uh, very user. It's not very user friendly. And um, also I think there was another that uh, was working with a PC and also it was a combination of the system. It was PC and uh, la it was laptop and cruiser. So one of them was not working properly. I think it was cruiser and laptop. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I just faced these two issues. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, Sean has a question. Um, so, hi, Parisa. Great presentation. Thanks. What is the area 
what area is the location shown on the screen? Does it have much existing cycling infrastructure? So uh, the area that uh, we were working on was part of the Penrith Conceal. It was the area around the St. Mary station. Um, and it was actually for SA1. It was uh, in a small area. And it has just, uh, if you have my screen, I think just this road had a um, bicycling, uh, some bicycling shared bike uh, space for bicycling. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, it was, um, I, I did not uh, bring uh, any further information for this uh, case, but yeah, it was just here and it was limited cycling infrastructure. And there was another thing that uh, students uh, have was that they evaluate uh, what will be the cost of the uh, cost of their, their design process. For example, we said that you will have a budget of uh, 50 million and uh, you need to um, consider that uh, they could measure for example they measure uh, this is the bicycling path and this is the cost of this path and uh, so they uh, measure their uh, design uh, proposed design uh, cost yes chris hi parisa great presentation just wondering if you could comment a little bit about um, you had a couple of the people from the council there at your workshop about, I guess, that the use of the tool and the data and the insights to to potentially help them plan for around this this precinct. Yeah, uh, so uh, we had um, invited um, people uh, who are engaged in bicycling planning from Penrith Council and uh, they uh, had a discussion with the students and also uh, they uh, said that, for example, this area cannot be a good place for this kind of cycling infrastructure or that area needs something else. They get a great insight to students uh, to what is, what is the need of the area. And it doesn't take a lot of time from them. I think it was just uh, two hours, two meetings in uh, one was uh, for understanding the current situation and one was uh, when the student was trying uh, to um, finalize their design and decide uh, what design scenario is better. So we engaged them at two stage and it was a very great collaboration uh, because uh, it makes everything clear for students and also uh, they were engaged in the process of uh, designing for uh, the, the final uh, design. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. No, thank, thank you very much, Parisa. That was a very interesting um, presentation. And I've, I've already seen this like with our um, meeting earlier, and like it, it, it's always like um, impressive the work which has been done through the City Analytics Lab. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And our second uh, speaker is uh, Nemanja Nikolic. Uh, Nem is a spatial data scientist who's uh, pursuing his uh, MPhil with uh, City Futures. And his research uh, areas are urban dynamics, property market, and network analysis. And he's going to talk about commercial geography of Sydney in terms of uh, sub markets in offices. Uh, over to you, Nem. Uh, hello everyone, thanks Bala. Yes, so um, yeah, my name is um, Nemanja Nikolic, or in short, you can just call me Nem. So I'll be just getting my presentation on the screen. Cool. Can you see the, yes. the screen? I always get confused when I'm doing presentations how to go to full screen on these ones. Uh, here we go. Yep, yep. Do you see my full screen? Uh, no, we, uh, it was earlier, it was good, but now it is, I, we are seeing the presenters. Okay, let me try one more time. If not, I'll just, um, I'll just sh share the, the PowerPoint directly. Uh, PowerPoint, full screen. Um, cool. Do you see the full screen now? Yes. Awesome. Okay. 
so as Bala said, we'll be going through the topic of um, of the submarkets, or more broadly, the uh, commercial geographies. Um, a few concepts will be used interchangeably here in terms of um, office submarkets and, and or office clusters. So we'll get into that a bit further. Um, so quickly on myself, um, yeah, in terms of my academic career, um, at the moment I'm doing an MPhil at the City Futures Research Centre as part of the Value Australia project. Um, also occasional get casual academic at, at one of the courses um, of the City of Master Analytics. And my background is in, in um, spatial planning. In terms of my professional experience, I've got around five years experience in consulting, government and the NGO sector. And, and again, um, working a lot of spatial analysis and GIS and urban planning economics and human geography and some of the places I worked down there, if you um, are familiar with those. So what I'll be covering today is um, a little bit about the background and the research objectives and, and the conceptual framework slash methodology. But what I really want to focus in is on the, the outputs. Um, there is a lot of them, so I'm not sure if, if I'll manage to do it all now. We might just um, race through a, a few slides if we don't, if we run out of time. But they'll all have a similar kind of layout in terms of the um, the outputs. You know, that we'll talk around analysis and the modeling and then the the conclusions and insights so when it comes to the the background of the topic and and the research objectives um the one thing that comes out constantly in the literature is a do do sub markets exist and most most papers and most studies um have, are within the the kind of neoclassical economics um, branch and school of thought and they're observing it you know from a highly kind of economic slash um, e economic perspective really so you know the assumptions that there is this perfect market um, and it you know has a number of assumptions related to it um, and due to market imperfections such as you know like limited information or heterogeneous products so slightly different um, product types, the few market imperfections arise that give existence to some markets. So I won't get too much into it. It's, it's, it's abstract, but um, in general, the, there's two things that pop up and that's um, substitution and, and the rule of one price. So th those are the two major main concepts in relation to some markets and substitution that purely means that um, two things are alike. So two houses are, are traded as within the same submarket, or you know, two apartments, or something like that, and that the rule of one price is applicable to them. That means that the the unit price of a bedroom is the same across those. Um, you can imagine different submarkets. So your submarkets of of um, you know a broader market is a uh, a market for cars, and then within that you have. Um, electric cars or cars that, that are, you know, work on diesel or SUV. So th those are simple examples of submarkets, and we have other similar concepts um, across other areas, such as industry, office clusters, and then functional regions in within urban geography and labor economics. And um, within this research that they will be kind of used. I won't have a very tight definition, but it would be we'll be um, incorporating some of these other elements from other studies. So one, one thing that also comes through um, literature is that there's a major focus on identifying submarkets and using structural components. By structural, I mean, you know, uh, what is the age of the building? How many bedrooms does it have? So th those would be kind of the, the supply elements if you observe it from an economic point of view. Um, and also there's a substantially smaller literature base for, for commercial property um, due to data limitations and a reduced number of transactions that occur in that market. And more broadly, there's a lack of understanding of um, the dimensionality of, you know, if you put the sum markets in an urban context, um, you know, what, what scale, spatial scale do certain processes occur at, um, time periods, so in general, there's not so much understanding on that. There were you, a lot of the studies, studies are purely at one point at time. 
And also, as I said, there's most of them focused on the supply side attributes and there's limited knowledge on demand aspects. So when it comes to the, the research objectives, um, there's a lot on the screen at the moment, but if you focus just on what's um, underlined, it's really around defining and differentiating demand-driven commercial office property submarkets. And to achieve that, you know, we're using, um, I'll be identifying and classifying certain processes and patterns. And those processes and patterns will tell me, um, again, how, how those submarkets are different from each other. What's unique to each submarket? You know, are there any patterns there, any processes? Um, and importantly, it will be done at the intra-urban kind of meso level. So a lot of the previous studies have been done at a micro level or macro, but there's a little uh, knowledge on that kind of mid-ground um, and accounting for spatial scale, so which is, again, I'm really emphasizing that because there hasn't been much on that. Um, and, and if you want to put it in a form of a question, you know, what classes of office clusters exist? What are the main factors that shape those same um, office cluster slash submarkets? And how can novel modeling, modeling techniques be used to achieve that? So briefly on the conceptual framework, as I said, it's it's not going to be just it's not just a economic point of view. It's also incorporating urban geography, urban study, housing study. So it's an overlap area where I'm trying to situate um, some markets in a broader context. So understanding um, the uh, putting it into, into a kind of a a system really. So one of the premises of urban geography is that um, it's a study of the city as a system where we have different factors and processes and outcomes and different scales. So it's very, it's alive, you know, it's more dynamic. Um, and as I said, the, the level that we're focusing on is the, the intra-urban geography. And if we look at it at a more graphical perspective, we can, um, if you look at the, the top area of this, the, the top half of the graph, um, you can see some of those um, examples of processes that occur across time. So we want things like decentralization, globalization, or the COVID pandemic. And obviously those processes impact um, different areas and submarkets uh, simultaneously. And at the same time, when we go lower at into more deeper into the macro, meso and micro level, we start um, seeing different patterns and different factors that impact um, those areas and differentiate them. For instance, label accessibility is an important factor that differentiates different submarkets from each other. Or at a more um, local micro level, it might be local amenity. Um, so I heard a, something in the background. Was that a question or something? It was someone joining. Okay. So in terms of the methodology, um, building on the previous graph, um, again, a lot on the screen, but you just need to focus on, on the top three uh, boxes. So there's three phases in, in, in getting to understanding um, submarkets, and that's one. First, we need to identify them. Um, two, we need to actually understand how they're different, you know, profile them. And three is... Um, incorporate that element of scaling which I've been talking about and, and dynamics in general and in order to achieve that if you look onto the right hand side where it's more graphical um, there, there's two major components one is um, land use zoning uh, two is occupations so as I said this is a demand driven approach to um, understanding and modeling some markets and one thing that we have um, a gap in here in Australia at the moment is that we don't have a data set that tells us what buildings are commercial, what buildings are residential. So we have to kind of use some sort of proxy and I'm using land use as a proxy for, for that. And then layering on top different occupations, you know, and trying to find out if there is a relationship. So for instance, do professional jobs occur in commercial zones? or do um, laborers work in industrial zones? And then using those occupations to find clusters across the city and essentially get um, the different categories uh, of, of submarkets or centers around Sydney. So like a CBD or a suburban center or um, something like Macquarie Park, which is a business park. So going on to the phase one, which is identifying some markets, as I said, it was it's a demand driven approach. So we have a, a lot of occupations 
um, based on census. And we're trying to find out um, if there is a relationship between occupations and specific built forms and locations. So there are other approaches to identifying submarkets, and there's a lot of literature on this. Um, on the supply side, you know, there's, if, if you look at, as I said, structural components and um, the building typologies or the um, allocational attributes. So there's a lot of different ways you can cut it, but there is the notion that um, using demand side attributes is kind of a shortcut to quickly identify um, submarkets. And as I said, this is a kind of a heuristic approach where a lot of a lot of analysis is trying to be done. So certain shortcuts need to be taken. I'm not saying that it's it, the demand um, aspect is inferior to the supply side element. So we have three major steps in this phase, and that's first categorizing the different zones, uh, predominant use. So you know we, we'll, we'll see this on the next slide. I'll explain this further, and then again the occupations. As we said, if the relationship with with officers, and lastly, identifying those occupational clusters uh, that are used as a proxy to um, of submarkets, and to achieve this, uh, our principal component analysis is used initially, and then um, various clustering algorithms um, to find that. And there's there's certain gaps. Um, in terms of the of how it's done outside of this research paper and previously, you know, a lot of this stuff is the, it's only kind of um, anecdotally known that uh, certain occupations occur in certain um, land uses or um, spaces. So people assume that that happens, but they don't have a, a data driven um, approach to actually find that or, you know, identifying clusters. A lot of the times it's done by eyeballing a map. So a lot of this is, is trying to give it a more uh, kind of um, em empirical um, foundation. So yes, as I said, uh, as you see on the left corner, there's a number of zones that are employment based. So a lot of employment occurs in them and they've been categorized to match uh, different, um, different types of built forms. So for instance, um, the, the B7, which is a business park, or B3, which is a commercial core, they're assume, they, they are pre predominantly um, allow for office users. You know, if you look at the legislation, or uh, if, for instance, the, um, the red bits, the health and education. So there's different zones in Sydney, such as the um, special precinct zones that are particularly uh, prescribed that only occupation, educational and um, health users can incur them there. So it's really trying to mimic the, the broad four or five categories of, of property sectors. Um, and as I said, get it, we don't have a data set that gives us the answer to that. So we're using the zoning and the legislation to kind of create a proxy for that. And there is certain issues here, you know, in terms of um, certain destination zones where that's, that's the lowest geography you can get the data where there are um, more than one zone, so those are excluded and only um, only um, hom homogeneous really uh, areas are maintained for the principal component analysis. And if we look at the principal component analysis, what it does is it um, it pretty much uh, is used for two things. One is uh, clustering, and two is a re a dimensionality reduction. And in this case, if you look at the biplot on the right hand side, all those little blue dots are those identified zones from the previous um, step. Um, and what we're doing is we're layering on top all the different occupations and we're seeing if there's a relationship um, among those two components. So you can see, for instance, um, there's you know professional occupation managers, which um, are the 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 axis, the, sorry, the loading, the by, on the black the loadings that are, that have most of the variation. So you know they capture um, most of the variation on the first principal component, and on the the second one, you know you can see a lot of um, industrial jobs, uh, such as laborers, machine operators, and technicians and trades. So it's already showing us um, clustering and um, grouping of different occupation in different areas. You know, that's what we want to really um, uh, find using this method. And if we zoom into the area along the professionals 
um, occupation, you'll see that a lot of the a lot of the areas are commercial zones. So North Sydney, Lavender Bay, North Ride, um, and then also some mixed use zones such as Surrey Hills, Homebush Bay, Silverwater. So this is telling us that along that professional occupation, there's a lot of these commercial areas where there are clustered within and um, there's obviously a clear relationship there. So it's not we're not assuming that professional occupations occur in offices. We actually see it in the data. And what's also interesting here is if we go back one step um, and look on the, the right hand side, this um, kind of the vertical uh, axis saying managers. Um, and on the left hand side, we see also community and professional um, workers and sales workers. We, we see that within these areas, there's also um, kind of a, a second tier um, classification where the, the uh, areas on the right have more managerial occupations, such as French's Forest and Belrose, and the areas on the left have some uh, additional number of jobs in um, retail. So it's, it's really good to not only finding along uh, if there is clustering, but also, it, you know, how these areas are different from each other. Um, so as I said, yeah, there's a clear link in the data between occupations and, and land use zones. Um, and previously that's only been done, done um, anecdotally in this instance, you know, people assume that. Um, and we also get the first high level identification of, of the nature of different submarkets, as we've seen with Fritch's Forest and Piemont, for instance. There is certain issues, but um, as I mentioned, um, and you can you know go further in terms of the, the occupation. So here I'm only using um, one and two digit codes for the occupations, but you can go further down to three and four digit. So I'm conscious we don't have too much time. What I what I'm think I'm going to do is I'll cover this next step of um, the actual uh, using the algorithms to spatially identify the the different offices office clusters and submarkets, and then I'll also try to cover one one other brief aspect. But so uh, with the previous stage, we've really identified that there is a clear link between um, professional occupations and commercial zones. And as we said, in, uh, the legislation is pretty clear in saying that the commercial zones allow uh, predominantly um, offices to be built within them. So now what we're using, we're using that uh, the occupations to actually spatially locate wh where those areas are. And there's a few different algorithms that have been used um, for this. First, more statistically driven. Um, one such as hotspot analysis and cluster outlier analysis. And what they do show us is where is the significant clustering around Sydney. So you can see, you know, the CBD, North Sydney, Macquarie Park, Parramatta, and that the, the clustering is strongest at around a bit over 1.5 kilometres in radius. Um, but this isn't sufficient to really identify all the little areas around the city. So th in the next step, we're actually using um, density-based clusters, uh, clustering algorithms such as DB scan, HDB scan, and optics to identify those areas. And what, in this case, um, optics was used as the best one. But what's what is really good about it is that it allows you to identify um, areas of varying densities. So you'll, uh, you'll identify the Sydney CBD and split it up into various sub components um, based on its own density and then do the same for something that's more like a business park, you know, in Macquarie Park or Balcombe Hills. So it's not using only a single density, but it, it can it can be used with varying densities. And what we get here is a much clearer picture. So um, we, we identify areas around the CBD, Piedmont, Surrey Hills, if you're familiar with Sydney, North Sydney, Chatswood, Parramatta, Liverpool, et cetera, et cetera. Um, colors here are used randomly that don't represent anything specific, just different um, clusters of offices and submarkets. You have Randwick there as well and Bondi Junction. And obviously um, some of these occupations, uh, some, some of these professional jobs occur at, you know, uni campuses and other occur in uh, skyscrapers and in the CBD and et cetera. But what we're really interested here is 
um, the ones that occur in in kind of um, office spaces that can be leased um, and and purchased. So it's not so much around the the health and education precincts, but more around those traditional um, employment centres. And as I said, you can see how on this um, graph, how the densities vary between the, so on the left hand side, you can get the CBD, which is quite dense. And then as you've moved further away from it, you, you, the densities also change. And yeah, the contributions, this is the first time I think I've seen optics being used for this. Um, usually it's k-means or um, something else, but not, not optics. Um, and as I said, yeah, it gives us a really good understanding of how the, the, the densities of the clusters vary. And I'll briefly just show you um, the, the most recent outputs that I got in terms of the, the different, differentiation between the different submarkets. So we've identified them um, spatially and we know where they are um, and where, you know, based on the professional occupations. But as I said in that one of the previous steps, well, what are the other secondary differences that exists amongst them. And to achieve that, um, there's a number of different, um, a number of different variables that have been used, mainly business and employment characteristics, because this is a demand driven approach to give us a more um, intricate typology of the sub markets. And the, again, there are other approaches, you know, like size and density or, um, you know, a, a, a large centre, a small centre, administrative functions, um, an area can be, uh, for instance, a strategic centre, urban mythology, what we've been talking, like suburban centre. But again, here we're focusing on, on demand-driven approach. And I'll skip this one and just show you um, the outputs, which are interesting. So as I said, there's things like business size, business turnover, private and public sector jobs, occupation mix, industry mix. Um, and if we look at how that looks on a map and, and actually what the algorithm gives us is, um, in this case, I've told it to find three clusters based on um, the elbow method, but pretty much what it's telling us is, if you look at the red line, it kind of peaks at different spots. The same goes with the blue and the, the green. Um, and if we go to the to the next slide, which is spatially representing what we found in this previous one, we um, get a differentiation of the blue um, centers, which have a higher number of professionals, um, occupations and IT industries and a mixed sector versus areas that are green, um, such as Sydney Olympic Park, Roads, North Ride. They have a lot of more managers and administration, uh, admin industry with a, a lot of private sector jobs. And lastly, um, with red colour so areas such as Liverpool, Parramatta, Cogra, um, they have a lot of administrative workers that work in the public sector. And amongst all of the different um, variables that were used, um, so business size, turnover, et cetera, et cetera, the ones that give um, the, the highest explanatory power are occupational type and employment sector. So I might stop there. Um, we ran out of time, but there is additional stuff that's been done in the meantime, but yeah, I'm becoming conscious that's probably a bit too much um, with the time I have. So I might end it there and, and just hand it over for any questions. Thank you very much, Nam. Very interesting presentation. Uh, I'll open the floor for questions. Um, let, let me start with one. Um, so how, how do you think um, this sub-market analysis and outputs are going to be valuable, um, be uh, mm -hmm. important for um, valuation of properties, like well, for commercial properties, like if you can mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the slides that unfortunately didn't have time to cover was um, actually um, actually looking at other measures such as accessibility and center characteristics to understand um, if there are differences there. But pretty much the the notion between uh, behind sorry um, using this approach and improving um, land valuation is that you're you're fi finding distinct groups. 
um, of homogeneous areas and that have similar characteristics and where um, you know an additional uh, where where accessibility is valued in the same way. So if you if you didn't didn't have this approach, if you grouped it all into like one big conglomerate and just ran some uh, automated valuation models or whatever techniques you have in mind, the problem would be that there would be too much um, difference in the data or in these groups, and it would um, compromise the results of of the the valuation method. So this way, you're really finding uh, different groups that are similar, and you're minimizing the the variation of the data, right? And hence, uh, improving the quality of your outputs. Because if you have something as you know the CBD and um, a, like a, a business park in the same group, they'll have quite different behaviors and and corrupt pretty much the analysis. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other questions? Yeah, so we have one. Over to you. Over to you, Rupa. Hi, Nemanja. Uh, thank you for your interesting presentation. I had um, two questions. Yep. Um, firstly, in your discussion or in your analysis, how will you be factoring in sort of structural changes in employment by professions? Because um, there's a global trend of, um, you know, casualization uh, of workforce mm -hmm. um, in specific sectors, um, yep. although, you know, precarious employment, um, contract casual employment, that as well as COVID is sort of restructuring, um, you know, employment trends by um, uh, industry categories and subsectors mm -hmm. as well. Um, th th that's my first question. The second is, are, are you going to validate your modeling and analysis by yep. discuss dis discussing your results and your methodology with some of the commercial valuers mm -hmm. in government and commercial yeah, property yeah, sector? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good question. And that, the second question, I think that's popped out numerous times um, across my conversations, and uh, it's a really, really valid one. So far, I've been that person validating it. Like I've, I have worked, um, yeah, as I said, five years in the profession, so I'm familiar. But you're right. Like I think uh, there is an ambition to do that. It's just like how much time I'll have. Um, but we also we're also looking into getting some some additional data um, from from um, you know, Collier, the ones of Collier's, JLL, um, Savills that that do some sort of similar analysis, but not probably not so much data driven. So I think that would also give us um, some insights whether the the sub markets we've identified are good. And from just looking at CBRE data and and the the number of sub markets that they have, there's probably a 90% match between what I've found with my um, research and what they have in their reports. Yeah. Um, so that, but yeah, it, it does require a more in-depth discussion. That's for sure. So, it, short answer: If I have time, yes. Um, and the first question, I guess, structural changes to employment. Yeah, I mean, like as you said, casualization, working from home, those are all really, really big questions. Um, I think you know, in this study, it's it's not so much around the the structural changes of um, employment. Like I, I am, I have done a brief analysis, um, a temporal analysis of um, the change of of the clustering of, of professional jobs. So you know, comparing back in 20, um, 2011 and twenty o six or 1991, so as far as the journey to work data goes, has there been a, a change in um, the, the density and clustering of the professional jobs? And what's that, you know, it gives you outputs that are quite interesting, you know, that for instance, you could pick up uh, Darling Harbour that was built at one stage and, and have a, had a, like a large influx of jobs at that point to that area. Um, but yeah, at, at the moment, I think it, it's, a bit out of scope when it comes to the the structural changes in terms of part time full time. The one thing I might include is it, it might be a variable in in the um, the 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 sorry the differentiation of sub market. So like an area might have more full time employees than it has part time employees. If that makes sense. Yeah, that does. Just going back to your first point, I would suggest that you also touch base with the Australian um, Property Institute, the professional association that. Yep. represents yep. valuers because um, you could go and present your findings to them as well and, and they can invite their valuer members. 
along yep. to get the feedback. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. And that the, in literature that constantly comes um, across is you know the importance of expert uh, delineated boundaries and submarkets. So it is it's a very valid point. Great stuff. Um, any other questions? I think like we are right on time. So if you have one more, uh, we can take one more question um, or we can conclude that. Okay. okay, so thank you everyone. Um, there have been like, a, so we had to like move everything to online, fully online this, this time. Uh, and thanks everyone for coming. And so provided the next seminar will be for, by uh, Professor uh, Stuart Barr from um, Melbourne, and be still not sure like how things are going to go. Um, so it would be we are looking at keeping it hybrid for now, and depending on how things are, like in a week we'll uh, reevaluate, re and if needed, it will be moved online. So um, that being said, yeah, thank thanks everyone, thanks for coming, and. Uh, Hoping to see you again in next seminar series.